Well, we're uh, on the home stretch, I guess, with the conference, so appreciate everybody being here. Just uh, by way of hands, just curious, um, kind of the makeup of folks here. How many are in a, a finance role today in the organization? Several, most probably. Um, other executive or membership roles? Okay, executive director? Yeah. Okay, so good mix. Great, thank you very much. All right, let's dig in here. Just quick background about myself. I actually started out as an auditor at Deloitte and & Touche and have been in the consulting world for about 20, 25 years now with RSM. And um, I guess that's what I call fun, is helping the, uh, the office of the CFO and businesses work better. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Quickly, one slide on RSM. We are the world's largest firm focused on middle market organizations. Um, we're the fifth largest in the US, and you can see the size we have globally. Uh, the presence we have is significant. All right, here's the challenge, right? An afternoon, average human attention span, eight seconds, the bad news, Worst news is that's less than a uh, goldfish, according to some study. But uh, that's the challenge, I guess. Hopefully, we'll make this interactive today. All right. So when we talk about modernizing the finance function, it, when when we talk about back office functions, you know, traditionally we looked at IT, HR finance as kind of these support back office functions. To me, that really is old thinking. And so as we think about IT, you know, how does technology really enable membership engagement and how do we use that to propel our business? It's not a back office function, right? HR, how do we really engage talent around our mission. It's not just a back office function. Similarly with finance, it's not just about historical scorekeeping. How is the finance function really moving, propelling in a strategic way the business forward? So that's what we're going to explore a bit today. So as we look at historical responsibilities, it is the fundamentals of we've got to have a handle on our financials our cash. We've got to have good fundamental controls and feel like you know we've, we've got segregation of duties, things are, are in a controlled manner. Um, and that we, we know how to pull that information together. So that's kind of the historical view. But as we talk about modernizing what happens in finance, we're really talking about how is the CFO, other financial leaders on your team, how are they driving insight? Where is the best business headed? What are the analytics and performance measures? What are they telling us? And what timely action do we need to do? And how are we partnering across the organization to really drive that kind of conversation? So this word agility to me is really important. I heard it said, um, this past year, you know, things have never moved as quickly and changed as rapidly as they have. But they will never move as slow again. So that's, that's kind of the reality, right, of the pace of change. So finance leaders, the, the ability to understand what is coming at us in a timely manner, what are the trends that we should be paying attention to, and how are we driving the right decision making timely is, is it's not only smart people, you gotta have the right tools and abilities and engagement with the business to make that happen. And you know, hopefully finance is not just a, a scorekeeper in your organization today. I mean, are we shaping strategy? Are we doing planning not only about our long-term strategy, but we're looking at our operational plans, our financial plans, 
kind of in totality? And are we finance, the role of finance, really instrumental in that process? All right. OK, so the fundamentals, um, an efficient month end close process. It varies a bit by industry type, but leading practice is generally thought of as closing the books in five business days. Now, why does that matter? Well, the reason I think it matters is I see a lot of clients that spend half to two thirds, three fourths of their month, the bulk of their resources, just trying to look at historical numbers and try to get the, the financials together. So what's the reality? If you're spending two thirds, three fourths of your time, you only have a few days to catch your breath before you start over again. And are you really able to do more than that historical record keeping role? So we've got to take a look. It, it does matter how quickly, not only is it timeliness in getting the financials, and a monthly view of financials is really, I think, going to become more and more obsolete as well. Do we have the, the measures and the insights throughout the month, at least on a weekly snapshot basis, so that the month in close is not the unfolding event, right? It is just kind of the formalization of, the, of those financials. Do we have, um, so these are some of the fundamentals. Balance sheet controls. At the end of the day, we need to be spending more time on the financial planning and analysis. So I just ask you, do you feel like in your organization you have enough talent and resources in place doing the financial planning analysis and forward looking as compared to what it takes for a historical record keeping? And does that matter to your organization? So that's part of what we'll be looking at. And then finance as a collaborative that's bringing ideas, perspectives to the organization. Are we partnering well? Can we do that better? If we did that better, what would be the impact? All right, so we've talked a lot about this. We, we got to think holistically, people, process, and technology as we start to, to look at how we modernize what we're doing in finance. Okay, so current state for a lot of organizations, we spend a lot of time doing things that are not very valuable or that are error prone. So 75% of effort is, is wasted, we have to redo it. If we're like looking at budget forecasts, we spend a lot of time changing those. Uh, the plans get outdated quickly, spreadsheets are, are error prone. And finance staff are buried with the basic duties and no time to really look at the analysis. That the survey data indicates that as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the journey. Here's a crawl, walk, run, fly kind of picture. I like this one that shows a picture of the journey. Uh, the maturity around what we do in finance. So if we're focused just on transactions, getting the historical record keeping in order and accurate, we're doing a good job at that transactional stage. If we're, we have a good handle on you know, relatively efficient processes, we've got control of how things are working, you know, we may have be at that stage too. If we're beginning to you know, have good reporting, some uh, insights into you know, where things are headed trending-wise, we're, we're beginning to, to look at that stage three. At stage four, we're really challenging the organization on, here's what we're seeing. Here are the trends. And we're strategically aligned with the business leaders to timely address and take action. So how do you get there? How do you, if we look at finance as not a critical asset to the organization and more of a back office function, 
it's tough to become a strategic business partner. So it takes a vision for how and why this makes sense to move up the scale. So, you know, I've done some polling. It's easier to ask the question, where do you see yourself on this page, right? And if we can do a kind of a blind survey, but does anybody venture uh, bold enough to say, where do you see your organization today? Or where, what your journey has looked like? Go ahead. Crawling right now. Okay. We're starting over. Just so you're rebuilding, is that part of kind of rebuilding your team? Yep. Leadership? Exactly. Okay. So how do well, we understand? Um, yeah, we, we brought in, a, in a, well, we have an interim CFO who, who's worked in uh, flying mode. So okay, he's so he's seen it before. before. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So we're headed that way. Very good. It'll, it'll come, I mean, there'll have to be some decisions made, right, of investment in talent, systems, people, and but you gotta know what you're expecting out of it, too. You know, what's the value? How are we gonna measure the value we're gonna get out of this journey? And why is it worth it? Right? Starts there. Anybody else? Sure. Uh, old enough? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm not. I'm a. I'm, excuse me. The CEO. So I'm. I'm not a CFO. Yeah. But uh, the the one that we have now, she also acts as a CEO. Okay. And our senior staff is five. And I really look to them. I look to her for a lot of just strategic guidance and on all matters, you know, on all things, whether it's you know producing a. Uh, uh, an annual conference, or whether uh, you know, she also deals with a lot of our, um, well, she oversees HR and these kind of issues, and uh, as well as leading some of our um, educational activities. So it's actually a pretty nice spot to be in because rather than just kind of being mm -hmm. focused on, we have accounting manager, we have yep. finance people, we really can use her broad uh, knowledge to help in all areas of so you, you have a controller that may do a really good job at maybe one and two. So then you have your CFO, COO role that's really, you've got the right person that can play that broader strategic advisory role. That's nice. Okay. Anybody else? All right. We can come back to that. But I appreciate sharing. All right. This is a lot of small type and you can look at this in uh, uh, the soft copy but if you just look at the highlights of what is a high performing finance function look like comparing and contrasting that journey so if we look at strategic planning is is the finance function helping support an effective strategic planning effort and are we attaching that to how we're measuring performance going forward, right? Budgeting and forecasting. Are we stuck in this, you know, heavy lifting once a year budget that very often becomes uh, stale? Or are we doing some rolling forecasting? Do we have some key measures that we're really holding people accountable to it that we're looking at trends? As far as risk management, organizational structure, let's talk a little bit about organizational structure. You know, when we think about finance, it depends on the size of the organization. Probably most of your teams are centralized. Sometimes, depending on the scale of the organization, you'll have some distributed roles. So thinking about what's distributed, what is uh, centralized is really important. And what, what are the roles of finance that are going to make a difference and an impact in your organization? I think being intentional and taking a fresh look at that. Um, because sometimes people have just kind of evolved in what they do and how they go about things. And we, I think it's, it's really healthy to take a fresh look and say, what, if we were to build or rebuild a finance team, what would we do? And how do our people align with that? And what are the gaps in talent? And what would it take for us 
back to that maturity, if we really value being more um, impactful to the organization forward-looking, what kind of roles do we need for that to happen? And then technology is so huge. Um, it's not just a finance decision, right? Technology really impacts the way we do everything end to end. Now, finance kind of gets um, stuck sometimes at the end of that. And if things are not flowing in an integrated fashion, sometimes it takes heavier lifting at the end of the day to get there. And, and the data is compromised. So I just uh, got out of a session on data analysis. I don't know if some others of you attended that. Um, there's a correlation here, right? It, it's not only understanding our business and the analytics of it and the technology that supports it, but it's how we engage with our members. That data analysis, external and internal. But that, that's a capability. To me, organizations that have made that turn where they see having the right capabilities on their team to do analysis, it may not be someone that's just um, grown along in, in our accounting or finance team. Um, very often, it's someone that is embedded in operations or membership that's kind of picked this up. But I, I would challenge for finance, we, we need to have data savvy people that help us um, move on this journey. Okay, some of the benefits. You know, I think that you can change culture. At the end of the day, that's hard to measure, but if you have an organization that really is looking forward, that really is engaged in agreeing on what we want to measure, and finance is really helping enable that, you will change culture. You will move the needle faster. So that's, that's a big part of it. And there is some real dollars on this. Um, at least in this study, for every dollar invested in business analytics, we realized an average return in excess of $10. Now, you've got to decide for your organization where it makes sense. Um, just putting in tools, hiring a couple of people will not get you here. You've got to tie it to your strategy. You've got to look at your processes end to end. You've got to look at this strategically. All right, so having the right people, I, this is hard for, for me, for a lot of us, is to challenge ourselves to say, do we have the right people that are going to help us continue to move on this continuum? Sometimes you need some fresh talent. And if we're, if we're the ones that have been in finance for a number of years, how are we, who are we bringing into the organization to make certain that we're not stale? We're, we're keeping a, a sense of urgency in terms of how we're moving uh, forward as a finance organization. Process, um, I see process lacking. Well-defined end-to-end processes is, is a gap. I, too many organizations take the shortcut to implement systems quickly and really don't have well-defined processes. So it takes both. If you don't have people and well-defined processes knowing how to engage and, and really owning how that system is going to come to life, your technology is going to be compromised. The right controls as well, of course. All right, we won't spend too much time here, but the, the fundamentals, obviously we have ERP systems supporting our transactional activities. Uh, the record report, we'll talk a little bit about um, Blackline and some other automation tools supporting, automating some of the closed process, and then tools supporting the analytics. There are lots of those to look at. 
So beyond this, you know, in the old days, people did a lot of custom development, right? They wanted a system that met their unique needs, and it took a lot of time and effort, and they tried to build exactly what they needed. Um, not as many companies are going down that road today for good reason, right? That's, it's a, although I see a lot of clients still struggling to move to a new paradigm, but the reality is there are a lot of great solutions out there, many of which are cloud-based or the kind of core ERP systems, but there are some great tools to fill the gaps that are easily deployed. So some of these workflow tools um, where you can have automated forms and workflow, so it goes from point person A, B to C. Um, you can automate a lot of processes where you have gaps in your core systems and deploy those very quickly. So I think looking at the, some of these tools that are available is, should be an important part of automation strategy. Um, Blackline. We'll take a little more look at, but there's certainly automation in terms of how we do reconciliations, how the workflow of month end, and how we do matching of receipts to uh, apply those payments in a very automated fashion, things like that. Can I ask? Yes. I can't. What is the blue circle? I can't. Next to concur. Next to concur. Yeah, it is. Um, I should know, shouldn't I? Concur is the one I'm, I've used the most. I'll get back with you on that. No, no worries. Sorry about that. No, no worries. Yeah. When you say we have top financial, is that just scale the number of installs and customer base, or is it top in terms of your assessment? quality or some other third-party research in terms of quality? As far as the tools that are listed, yeah. I would just say these are some of the more common ones. Uh, these are not exhaustive. I mean, Gartner does a great job of profiling you know, the top quadrant tools in any particular space. And you can get you can do a Google, Google search and, and get to those um, without any cost. But it, it depends on your needs. We spend a fair amount of time doing system selections, obviously, to, to get to the right place. But at the end of the day, these are some some well proven tools to uh, in this space. Um, financial planning and analysis. I think this is an area that's um, definitely worth investing. I still see a lot of middle market, mid-sized organizations that are using Excel to do all their planning. And it's really difficult to do that. You can do scenario planning. You can really update your plans in a much more robust way. Um, you can look at a pending opportunity. If we did X with you know, this program, or if we made an acquisition, what would that look like? You can build that into your modeling very, very easily. And then I'll just touch on the last one, robotics process automation. Um, a lot of larger organizations are well down the road with RPA. Um, we see the middle market and mid-sized organizations beginning to look at where you have manual, high volume, um, time consuming activities where someone is taking data from this website and then adding you know, uh, um, information from our ERP system and then this other data load and then I, I batch this together and that creates my, the data I need for my reconciliation, whatever it is. It, it can, um, RPA can basically automate all that. So they're defined fields, defined rules, and then it can even learn you know, based upon that. So uh, this is, it, it's really kind of, like a visual basic and Excel on steroids that RPA is playing today, if you think about it in that way. Uh, but they're very easily deployed, not heavily dependent on IT. And that's, I guess, maybe the other thing here is that 
we see a lot of organizations constrained by how much IT can do, right? And how fast they go can be sometimes the biggest constraint for how fast we as an organization can implement automation. Well, the reality is a lot of these tools need to be done in coordination with technology leadership for certain. And we need to have a plan as an organization on how we're, we're, how we're executing here. But a lot of these can be owned by the business and be implemented pretty easily. Um, so that's certainly cloud-based. Even the ERP systems usually are now owned by the business. You know, IT's got to be supporting those fees, but it, it is a different ball game today. So lots of other tools that make the, and there's still a place for app dev and you know, web build out, and, and, but there are a lot of tools that automate those functions that have been custom developed in the past. Okay, let's talk about a few specific areas. There are four that I had on, on the page to talk about. One is, do we understand the profitability of our service programs? Look a little bit at financial close automation, a little more closely at budget and forecasting, and analytics. So this first one for program profitability uh, I'm assuming most of your organizations are not profit, not for profit organizations. Uh, there may be some exceptions here, but uh, regardless, in my experience, a lot of not for profits really don't want to be to break even. They really need to have some surplus. They need to be able to support some future growth. But you've got to rationalize what that is. So, do we know how our programs? and the activities that are consuming our, our costs are really driving our profitability or, or not. And of course, there's a financial view, then there's also what's of value to our members view, and both of those have to be looked at. So in order to, uh, we need to understand this for long-term sustainability. And I liken it to manufacturers, uh, we see a lot of companies in, in that industry that keep coming up with new products, but they don't go back and rationalize something we developed five years ago. Are we really selling enough for that to make sense? Is that still valued? Are we pricing it ap uh, accurately? Do we understand our margin? I think the same thing plays out here. Uh, so, so for targeted areas, do we understand the real cost and margin for our programs. And having a way to understand the direct cost as well as uh, some of those key allocable costs I think is, is key. So just as an example, you know, we may have a, a number of conferences, events, some journals, some learning certification programs, do we have a view of where we're making money or not? And do we rationalize that in light of what is valued by our members? So maybe we'll just open it up a little bit. How do we think we're doing on this front today as, as um, organizations? Anybody? As far as what? And how, do, we under, do we understand? our profitability and what's driving it? Are we making decisions timely around that? Go ahead. Well, I mean, as an executive director, all my metrics <clears throat> with the financials are tied to programs and programs and services. Cost per attendee, cost per event. Okay. Um, uh, did a tracking study of my staff's time and where they spent their time. and. Um, for six months, so I could do an overhead allocation um, for indirect costs, um, so I could demonstrate things. I mean, I, I don't know how else to you know, sit in the boardroom and, oh, we make so much money on training. Do we really? Yeah. <laughs> how do you know this? <laughs> so have you seen situations where there maybe was uh, an assumption or kind of a, a feeling that we were doing well over here, but when we really looked at the data, we 
we found differently? Within, you know, I've been with this, my new group for a year, and their assumptions, I don't want to say were wrong, but they were quite off course. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's very critical um, from my standpoint as an executive director that you've got to understand your metrics on your programs and services and the money. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, <laughs> that's where the rubber meets the road. Yeah, absolutely. Other comments on that? Yes. Yeah, I would echo that. Uh, when when I started, I'm only well, only in my role in here. The budget reports were organized by a strategic priority, and I said, how can we possibly understand the business unit? You know, if it's organized in that way. So we switched around and understand what 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 our direct and indirect costs are for every business unit. And then when people were making the statement that their program makes all of the revenue, and then I could show them that, well, actually you're taking a loss, you know. Yeah. It's actually not four hundred thousand dollars, you're spending eight hundred thousand dollars on it. So yeah. it, it opened up. Others? Yeah, so we do something like this chart for our um, work orientation. Um, you know, we look at core programs, means, uh, publications, uh, membership. Those are all of our contribution margin. We try to stay away from the profitability. Sure. So yeah. contribution margin. Mm -hmm. And then on the same scale, you know, where you know, finance and administration, advocacy, that, you know, they're buckets that they people can understand the revenue is coming from where as paying for program products and services you know that the members want desire and there is a balance you know, there's a balance and uh, we try to focus back on you know if we're going to make investments we need to make sure that we focus on you know where the revenue where our profit is coming from but also be able to generate surpluses so to take risk like strategic directions right. That may be off the PL. Uh, still on the expense, revenue expense side, but you know, a separate off the PL. So it, you can have more risk there. So we're certainly focused on our organization, sort of, certainly focused on generating operating surpluses. But we know that is a challenge uh, to defend things like advocacy, uh, our strategic directions, or giving back initiatives that are so important. I, you, we do have things that we just inherently are going to spend money on because we're mission driven. Yeah. Um, so, but it, it's important to show you know, we do this, and this is what we're investing in. But at the same time, we you want to know how much you're really spending on that. You know? so, so one thing we do to address that is we measure it against the budget that was established for it. So mm -hmm. how is it doing? It? We have programs that are budgeted to lose a million dollars. So did they lose eight hundred thousand, or did they lose one point two million? Yeah. That ultimately, in the end, that's the performance goal that they're yeah. that they're accountable to, right? So, and that allows us then to make informed strategic decisions of where we want to spend our money without devaluing them. Because that's the thing that you have to be careful of in the eyes of the members or people who don't know. Well, they're losing a million and a half dollars. Why are we doing that? It's the mission. Well, we, we do need to be able to answer that question why right. we are doing it. Oh, absolutely. It. And why the data, right? That's yeah. not a financial answer. Purely. That's a mission. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's why it's important to have metrics, that financial metrics tied to programmatic metrics. Mm -hmm. So we maybe lost $800,000, but we did, you know, we were able to um, visit this many people with our message or, you know, Find, find a couple metrics that can be tied to that so that you can communicate the value of that. Um, sometimes I think that's important. Yes. Um, yeah, no, I don't even know if I would call it a loss. It, it, it's an expense that yeah. we budgeted for, right? I mean, it's a loss if you weren't expecting <laughs> to expend it. Right? Yeah. 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 All right. So I think the theme here is we. We need to understand the data. We can't manage it strictly by feel, but it needs to tie back to strategy and mission. And ultimately, it does tie back to what is the value 
through our membership to our customers. And some of these may, it may make sense to invest or operate a loss if it's going to sustain you know, the value we're providing. But you got to understand the totality, how you make this sustainable, right? And, and what, what, what made strategic sense five years ago in driving value and made it, it make sense to invest in, in, in a loss may change. And that's where it gets difficult, right? To say, have we taken a fresh look at this? Are we really challenging ourselves of what makes sense today? Right? Just a, a point to tag on to a couple other comments. A few years back, we, we provided information much like that, much like this chart, and uh, we moved away from it. Okay. We, give the, we give the numbers, we're not hiding anything, you know, and compare the budget to the points you guys were talking about as well. It just seemed like visually, for the board and some of the leadership, you, you get them the struggle, yeah. and they're, well, they're going to say, why yeah. are we charging so much for conference yeah. B? It's too much. We're making too much. That's, That's why we did it against the budget. Yeah. You show yeah. the dollar figures against the we budget. We show the variation to the budget, not variation yeah. to the and they don't And they don't bring up anything like right. that, but they look at that, that yeah. big yeah. bar. Yeah. Okay. Very good. All right. We'll touch on this. Um, how many of you have heard about some financial close automation tools like Blackline or Trentex and things like that? Is, is anybody? Okay, a little bit. Um, I, I think this, you just have to evaluate what's right for your organization. Um, let me ask this question. How many of you are content with and where you are on your financial close timeliness and how that is working today. How many would say we're, we're in a good place? One, two, or three? So some of us feel like we're it's not broken. You know, we might be able to automate a few more things, but it may be not the highest priority. Okay. Others um, feel like there is a need, an opportunity there. It's, a, it's been very amazing. Okay. So very, you know, sometimes it's three days, sometimes it's three or four weeks. Wow. Wow. So okay. I've made some staff changes. But I'm with, with you on that. Our, ours was nine months late. You're oh you're that close. Yeah. That, that is yeah. That and that's tough to survive, actually. Okay. And, and so it's, to me too, it's not just about the timeliness of it, it's the amount of resources that it, people time. It's yes. Really it's strong, right? the they level get it done on time, but what's the effort that it takes to get it done? Right. And sometimes and we do a lot of assessments on how, you know, what's really going on at month end and, and just shadowing people to say, what are you doing? And, and we really just giving a bird's eye, a fresh view as to what's really going on. We, it's amazing what we see people doing. And when you ask them why, and you really connect the dots to what they thought, the reason they thought they were doing something to what ultimately made a difference, um, there are many situations, there are hours of people's time consuming things that don't really matter. They don't really matter. And so, you know, how, how do you add value and get over the hump if you're stuck in Doing, spending a lot of time, time on things that maybe are not impacting the, the results in a big way, not material, etc. So I think taking a fresh look back to the processes is part of it. Um, automation is a big part of it. You can, you can eliminate a lot of time through tools to where you're um, up to half of reconciliations we've seen be automated through some auto certification business rules um, within certain parameters. Um, and you can kind of dial that in by month or by quarter based upon what makes sense. Um, and drive a lot of automation through just matching the transactions, et cetera. So we're, this, is a, um, this is an area that's grown a lot over the last few years. I won't go through the case studies, but we do work with a lot of clients in this space. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about budgeting and forecasting. Um, so a lot of organizations traditionally have done a single budget, and sometimes that can take several weeks, not uncommonly a few months, to develop, and it's painful. Um, honestly, budgeting is the area I probably hear the most complaints from even CFOs. It just takes too long. The effort that we put into this across the organization, we're not getting the value out of it. I think this is an area we've really got to take a fresh look. And the organization may be different, but too many are spending a lot of time developing a detailed budget that then we spend a lot of the remainder of the year trying to explain why things are different and a lot of analysis around that. And really, what, what, are we, what are we impacting through that effort? So I think more organizations are starting to say, um, Michael, is that your name? Um, to move more towards, let's get a basic annual target in place. We need that, right? But let's do it at a level that doesn't take a huge effort, provides sufficient accountability, the key measures we need to, to look at. From there, let's really put more of our effort on a rolling forecast of key measures and how we're timely managing to those targets, as opposed to explaining why six months into the year we're at a different trajectory and it's really not relevant anymore, and then we're it's just it's just not a meaningful conversation. And there's a lot of activity that goes into supporting that. So I think this is one of the areas that finance leadership and executive leadership of, of all areas should be looking at. Uh, I do believe that having good tools and some people that are good at analytics, financial analytics, building that up PA function we talked about earlier, is where there's more value. We've got to find a way to deploy some resources in, in this space. And, th and that's where we can really make an impact on the business. So maybe I'll just pause there. Any experiences around budgeting and forecasting that um, someone would like to share? Yes. Um, yeah, I, as a CFO, I continually hear that it needs to be shorter yeah. you know, less. <laughs> Uh, um, invasive, easier, simpler, at a higher level. I guess the accountant in me knows that I need the detail in order to get all you guys over there the, the data that you need to, to make those decisions. And so it's, it's you know, we, we've shrunk our, I guess, our budgeting from five or six iterations down to probably three iterations last year. So when I say iterations, the back and forth. Right. We do the port, we do projections. You know, we set the budget mm -hmm. and we do a projection three or four times a year. It's a not exactly a rolling forecast, but it's somewhat. Um, but now the challenge is that three is good, but one would be much better. So that that to me is a huge challenge to be able to to set a budget, say here we go, do the plan. We have to work with our board. Our board is going to approve that so we can move forward. So we have to have something, you know, whether it's pictures or graphs or numbers, estimate numbers for them to prove. But the challenge is to, you know, to get the non-financial people, the program people who want to do the high-level strategy to do, you know, the work they need to do yeah. to take the time out to give me the time. To do their best in that one iteration. So that's what I'm looking at. Probably when I get back from this meeting. <laughs> well, and I would say too, from the non-financial side, the programmatic people that put the budgets together have their budgets because their performance is often evaluated on budget. So when they submit their budgets to you, they're making them safe. So you take, you know. 40, 50, 60 different people's budgets, and you throw them together, and they all have been 
made safe, yeah. that's a significant amount of padding yeah. that could be somewhere else. So how, how do you deal with that, I'm sure, is quite challenging as well. Especially when your revenue is only so much. So if right. everybody pads <laughs> and your revenue yeah. is right. going up as much, then you, that's why you do the iterations and you come together as a leadership group. And in, in comparison, a couple years ago with Shark Tank, I hate our no, a hunger game. Why do we have to be a hunger game? Why is my program always a, like because you're all padding you would you would just come to me with an honest question. Right? <laughs> yeah. We wouldn't have to do a hunger game. But right. there we are. I think what we do to stop that and you're not gonna ever get it coked out is we actually compare these people against how the, their year end forecast against their actual the prior year and see how off they've been. And, and when when, when they it's not good, right? That's right. right. You say, hey, you you've been under, you know, you've been padding this, we don't believe your numbers, we have a budget team that looks at it and then sends it back and challenges them and say, you know, and Ron, my boss, kidding me, goes, if your, if your job depended on it, would you say it's this? He's like, I don't care if you're over or under, it's how close you get to the amount. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, go ahead. Yeah, when, so the week before I started, which, which was a year ago, um, I was asked in a call yeah. with, with the uh, with directors, um, and everybody was uh, yelling for what they wanted as part of the programmatic stuff. And um, it ended up being they were 1.8 million over budget. I said, how, how do you even work with that? So I said in this last year, we're copying over last year's budget. Let me know if you have any major projects, programs, and you know, speak now or forever hold your peace. And so, got about three hundred thousand dollars higher than what last year's was for major projects, and that's how we moved ahead. I mean, it was easy, mm -hmm. but if you start over each year, yeah, it's not working. Yeah. So we've come up with a. I think it's somewhat interesting solution, and it's working for us. So our process is, as we start the budget cycle, I meet with the finance committee and then the executive committee, and we establish really high level targets. So, forty million dollar revenue. Um, we want a million dollars net at the end of this year, and that becomes the goal. We then have everybody put together their wish list, and this is how we deal with the padding, the wish list. Put together the best thing you can, and we come up with something like. You just described one point eight would be great. Usually we're off by four million dollars, right? Yeah. Because we know that's not going to be realistic. But now everybody's had a chance to say everything they want. We bring all the managers, all the people who own the budgets, into a room for a day. And the best way I can describe it is a floor on Wall Street. So they have to get up and they have to justify their projects to their peers. This is why I'm doing it, and it's not just justified on financial terms. They can justify it based on mission driven or. And then there are new products. There's four categories, basically new products, operational improvement, strategic initiatives, something else. And they get all get a chance to say their piece. That's the morning. The afternoon, we work as a team to get to the goal that the finance committee set. And we don't leave until we've reached that goal. And there are times where we're sitting there arguing over a thousand bucks, right? Where are we gonna we need another thousand dollars? Who's gonna add it up? And and they're coming together in teams. But the cool thing that we found out of this that we didn't expect was the amount of synergy that we were able to drive among the departments when they, once they all knew what each other was trying exactly. to accomplish, and they said, you know what, we're gonna do a new book on corrosion in pipelines, and we're gonna run a new course. Can't we do something, you both put money in for marketing. What if we came together and marketed them together and mm -hmm. saved half the price? Cool. It has worked for us, and the other cool thing that comes out of it is everybody knows everybody's budget inside yes. out and what they're doing. Yeah. So they challenge and hold each other. Well, you have more buy-in across the Absolutely. organization through yeah. that process. Yes. I haven't had that. Yeah. I used these called the dark room meetings. I haven't had that one dark room meeting since we did that. That's when you yeah. come in and meet with me yeah. and get your budget right to get the padding out or whatever yeah. it was. I, yeah. I haven't had to have one since we started. That's great. Uh, very good. Well, it's a great discussion here. I know we're running a little tight on time here. Um, I'll just share one quick story. Um, a client of ours made the move, not for profit organization, to go away from an in depth detailed budget to a rolling forecast. And the way they did it, they got engagement and buy in from the board, the 
across all their executive leadership team. And basically, they came up with what are the key measures by department that are going to be indicators uh, for performance tied to where we're headed, our overall financial targets, and began measuring those key measures by department. And what they found, just after a few months, instead of a discussion where finance is going out to you know, each department and saying, hey, why are we 20% over budget here and there, what are you going to do about it? Instead, the department leaders were really owning what actions, they were coming to meetings and discussions on what they were doing before they were even asked to get to their agreed on target measure. So just some thoughts around kind of what can be done there. All right, having a good plan and approach, we won't go into this. There are many fundamentals, uh, some good discussion there. So some of this content will be uh, in your deck. All right, how much time? We have just a couple of minutes, right? All right, so what I'll say on analytics, um, finance has a role, and I would like to think can have a leading role in analytics for your organization. And uh, there's certainly a number of places where this can play out, but um, are, are we engaged as a finance team? Do we have, do we understand our data? Are we proactive in getting the right data together? Do we have people with the talent and time to really analyze the data? There's, there's a lot of opportunity, and this is probably one of your best opportunities to engage ongoing with the business, right? Is if we, we are engaged around the analysis of, of our programs, um, with our membership, I mean, this is, this is the core of what we do. Um, so I would just say that um, understanding your data and have a good infrastructure for that is critical. But I would just say the other piece is the right people and the talent. You can't redeploy just anybody to be a good analyst. So I think this is an area for investment, for finance, um, is to have better, more analytical, data savvy uh, folks that can help us enrich how we pull the data together and provide those, uh, those conversations to the business and the foundation around it. So that's, that's really it. Um, I think we're about out of time. But, you know, I, I hope you got something out of this today. I really appreciated the interaction. I thought there was some good sharing. Um, a lot to do. Hopefully, we see that finance is not just a back office function, that we need to challenge how we continue to lead um, the business strategically to drive you know, financial results for us. So thank you all very much.